Joining us now on the line from Calgary, Alberta, there's Ezra Levant. He's the author of Shakedown, How Our Government is Undermining Democracy in the Name of Human Rights. Ezra, good to have you on TVO again. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for having me. You are great, aren't you? Well, you know what? I've managed to turn lemons into lemonade in the best sense of the word. I mean, three years ago, I was charged by the government of Alberta with hate speech, and I was in investigated for 900 days by 15 bureaucrats. But I think I've turned that around. I was acquitted of all those charges, and I've been telling the story about how badly behaved these human rights commissions are and how they actually hurt our human rights. So I think I've turned something bad into something good. Let's talk about some of the background. What is it that you wrote that they found so egregious that you were taken before this commission? Sure. In February of 2006, I was the publisher of a news magazine called The Western Standard, and we were one of the only media in the country that showed some of those Danish cartoons of the Muslim prophet Mohammed. We showed them because they were the cause, purportedly, of so many riots around the Muslim world that killed a hundred people. We wanted to show our readers what all the fuss was about. Now, you can agree or disagree with our editorial decision to run those cartoons. Our readers loved it. But one fella didn't like it at all, and he went to the police and tried to have me arrested. The police didn't arrest me, but this other government agency, a secular government agency, essentially prosecuted me for almost three years for blasphemy. But I believe in the separation of mosque and state, and I, I said, no, he, uh, part of human rights is freedom of the press, freedom of religion. So I stood my ground, but most people don't. Most people get run over by steamrollers when these human rights commissions come along because they don't respect the same rule of law and natural justice that our real courts do. Just in, in the interest of uh, historical accuracy, I think you were the only publisher in the country to publish the said cartoons and I think TVO was the only broadcaster in the country to broadcast those cartoons. You're right. Let me give you credit because no not, other not broadcaster looking for did. It, not looking no, for it. Just putting that well, out there on the record. I, and I know you weren't and I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. But come on, I mean, w uh, we talk about everything in our free and democratic society. We're not afraid of controversy. Well, let me follow up on that then, Ezra. Do, do you believe that there ought to be any curbs at all on free speech? Well, certainly, but let me give you a few examples. I believe in copyright law. I believe in the law of defamation, where truth is a defense and fair comment. I believe in the laws against fraud and forgery. But in each of the things I've just listed, first of all, there's real defenses. I mean, you're allowed to have uh, your honest opinions and say the truth. And they're handled in real courts. But, but these human rights commissions don't follow the same rules when it comes to defense. I could say something completely truthful, but if it hurts someone's feelings, that's no defense. Well, let me, read, let me read something that came out of the Calgary Herald last summer. I'm sure you saw this at the time as well. University of Calgary law professor Kathleen Mahoney is absolutely right, says this writer, when she says the outcome of Levant's case demonstrates the process works. It does indeed, and without such institutions as human rights commissions, where would people go for redress? In other countries, when people feel their racial or religious identity is under attack, they take up arms. Here, we have a civilized outlet for making such complaints, the Human Rights Commission. What's your response to that, Ezra? No, because I was acquitted after a 900-day ordeal, literally 15 government bureaucrats and lawyers on my case. But in a real court, when you're acquitted, the guy who prosecutes you, who harasses you with a nuisance suit, he has to pay some of your costs. Not so here. I, I was out of pocket $100,000. I didn't have real defenses. As I say, truth and fair comment are, are real defenses. There's no penalty to making nuisance or harassment suits. Um, the Human Rights Commission in Canada, the various Human Rights Commissions, have the right to make a warrantless search and seizure of my office. Even real criminals aren't subject to warrantless search and, so and seizure. In the, in the occasion then, or on the occasion then, when, let's, let's say you're a member of, a, of a, an identifiable minority group. And if which you I feel, am, actually. Which one? I'm Jewish. Okay, so if you feel that your rights have been um, put upon by somebody and you would like to do something in response to that, Obviously, you don't like the whole taking somebody to the Human Rights Commission. What do you think the preferable response ought to have been? Well, I want to zero in on, on you said my rights have been hurt. There is no such thing as a right not to be offended. That's a counterfeit human right. Okay, your <laughs> you feel your identity is under attack then. Let's put it that way. Well, that happens every day to me, Steve. I mean, I hear things that offend me or upset me every day. I just turn on the TV, and most of the time I ignore it. Sometimes I grumble to my friends and family. If I'm really mad, I'll write a letter to the editor, call a talk show. Maybe I'll even go out and start my own magazine. Maybe I'll run for public office. There's so many legitimate, peaceful, civil responses when you're upset. But, but what running if it's to the government... Okay, if, what if it's really something very egregious, though? And since you mentioned you're Jewish, I'll, I'll pick the, you know, the, the mother of them all. 
You know, what, what if you got into something with somebody who's a Holocaust denier? Do you think the person ought to have the right to be able to do that willy-nilly based on no facts whatsoever? Absolutely. I mean, since when is having a dumb opinion against the law? I mean, let's take David Ahenikew as an example. He was a 70-something Aboriginal former chief in, in Saskatchewan who muttered something about Hitler being great and the Holocaust being a fake. Well, the answer that most people should say is, who cares? He's some doddering old fool that won't convince anyone. The only people who listen to him are his grandkids because they have to. But because he was charged, now he was charged with criminal offense of hate speech, but it's the same principle. He was turned into a national celebrity. Hundreds of thousands of people heard about his foolish ideas that they wouldn't have had he not been charged. And look, Canada uh, is a place where you can say stupid things. No one was convinced by this old fool. Okay, not but stupid though, Ezra. Hateful. Hateful well, and injurious. That's different than it, stupid. Hey, injury, well, hateful is different from injurious. Okay. Injurious means you've hurt my property, you've hurt my body, you've, you've, you've damaged me in some way. Having a feeling is not an offense, Steve. It, I mean, and let me read to you, I know it from memory, the charge I was charged with. It's, it's under the Federal Human Rights Commission and various provincial commissions. It's against the law in Canada to publish anything that's, quote, likely to expose a person to hatred or contempt, unquote. Steve, that's crazy. Exposing a person to feelings is against the law? I mean, according to that definition, if you go to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and you leave with hateful feelings towards Germany, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial, is guilty of a hate crime. That's seriously the, the case. When you say that, a, but, but is it not beneficial to a society to try to reduce the amount of hate that we inspire uh, through our writings towards one another? Is that not well, an, see, a, a, an intrinsically good thing to do? Well, uh, hate comes from a feeling of a grievance, real or imagined. And if you just shut someone up and say you're not allowed to feel hate, you're not going to stop them from hating people. If that's all it took is a government law, we would have passed the Love Each Other Act a long time ago and everything would be fine. Steve, it's the opposite. By having freedom of speech, that's a safety valve where we can blow off steam and have it out in the court of public opinion and the marketplace of ideas will sort it out. Okay, let me see. In, Go in, ahead. The, in the case of your tribunal situation, let's say it hadn't gone the way it had gone. Let's say that they had found that you had broken uh, a law and that they were going to punish you. What kind of cr uh, punishment were you looking at? Well, uh, in the first instance, fines, probably in the ten dollars to $20,000 range, ordering me to give a page of my magazine to my antagonist. By the way, that, they offered me a plea deal about halfway through. They said if I paid him a th few thousand bucks and gave him a page in the magazine, I could go away. Uh, 90% of people take the plea deal. Um, so I, I would have probably mean order to that. Another case had someone subject to a lifetime speech ban. And if I would have disobeyed this Human Rights Commission order, it's filed with a real court. So it takes on the power of a court order. And if I would disobey it, I would be in contempt of court. And the very first person charged with hate speech in Canada in 1977, he, he refused to obey the government when they said stop being rude and offensive. He wound up serving nine months in jail. By the way, that's more time in jail than most people serve who are convicted of rape. Steve, that's not Canadian. It's not Canadian to put someone in jail because they have offensive ideas. Now, if they hurt someone, if they damage someone, if they're uttering a death threat, if they're calling for murder, we already have criminal code provisions to deal with that. Now, let me pick up on that word hurt because you said if they hurt somebody. You obviously meant yeah, hurt physically in injurious. in a physical way. But what, yeah. if, what, what, what if the hurt is not physically injurious, as in breaking the skin and making somebody bleed, what if the hurt is just to someone's reputation, to someone's feelings, that kind of a thing? Well, those are two different things. To someone's reputation, we have defamation law, but it's got defenses like truth and fair comment. And remember, when you sue someone in defamation law, you have to hire your own lawyers, and if you lose, you have to pay the other guy's lawyers. These human rights commissions, the, the government of Alberta paid the half million dollar bill to prosecute me. The radical imam was laughing. He didn't have to pay a penny. And when he lost, he didn't have to pay costs. And in real defamation courts, you have real judges following real rules. These human rights commissions are not run by judges. Often they're not even lawyers. In Manitoba, for example, there's a couple of human rights commissioners. There's one finished high school. I have nothing against people who are high school grads, but I don't want someone who just has a high school diploma weighing constitutional values like freedom of speech and, and religion. Okay, I mean, but I'm inferring from your answer then that you would like to see some of the legal jurisprudential traditions coming into this area as well, like for example, if you bring a frivolous or vexatious suit against somebody and you lose, 
You have to pay their legal costs, and you want to see something like that? That would be a great start because it would stop a lot of the nuisance suits. But even if we had all the regular rules of court, real judges, real rules of evidence and procedure, no hearsay, etc., <laughs> that would be a step forward. But still, Steve, I want to come back to my earlier point. There is no such thing as a human right not to be offended. Mm -hmm. that, that's counterfeit. It's not real. In fact, it violates genuine human rights like free speech. I wouldn't want a real judge implementing a hate speech rule. There's no such... If we ban people from having hurtful feelings, then we're vetoing all discussion. We're basically giving a veto to the thinnest skinned person hmm. in the room. That's not that's not the Canadian way. We are a country that loves vigorous debates, and if someone's rude, we have other ways of dealing with it. We marginalize them socially. We, I mean, here's an example. Jacques Parizeau, on the eve of the, of the referendum, blamed money and the ethnic vote, and right. it was taken to be a slur against Jews. He wasn't charged or sued, but he was marginalized. From that moment on, he was a bit of a political pariah. And I bet he lost a lot of invitations to dinner parties, and he was looked down on by society. That's appropriate. Let me follow up on that issue I was talking about a moment ago. If respondents of human rights complaints, the respondents, receive the same kind of funding as the applicants, would you be more in favor of human rights tribunals at all? Only very slightly, but I don't want to subsidize litigation. We already have too much litigation in Canada. Look, I think that every day people do suffer real grievances and real hurts to their feelings and setbacks in life, but I don't think we should run to the government to have it out before a judge, even if both sides are funded. I think we should be grown-ups, and if someone hurts your feelings, ignore them or argue back or get political about so it. So would you like to ban these tribunals altogether? Let's just get rid of them? Repeal them. Yes, absolutely. Canada is the most harmonious, tolerant, multicultural society in the world. Maybe because we've got these things. As if. These things have outlived their usefulness, and that's the problem, because to justify their existence, uh, they've got to go after wackier and wackier counterfeit human rights claims just to keep busy. Now, here's a statistic for you. In Alberta from 2007 to 2008, the number of complaints to the Human Rights Commission fell by 15 percent, even though our population is booming and more multicultural than ever. Yet the government just gave them a 26 percent budget increase. Well, they've got to justify that now by going up to drum up disharmony. And Barbara Hall, your Ontario Human Rights Commissioner, said the same thing. She wants to see complaints spike, to use her word. That's not healthy. I don't want to pay people to go and stir up disagreements and discontent. Well, We're grown-ups. We, we just reformed the process here, and I shouldn't say we, the government of Ontario just reformed the process here in Ontario, where they kind of split the, the function of the human rights, the old Human Rights Commission, in half. They've got, as you said, Barbara Hall, the chief commissioner now, essentially whose job is not to hear individual cases anymore, but to go out and, I guess in her words, spread the good word for good feeling and good cheer across Ontario. And then if you've got a complaint or a problem, you will go to this new body, which is the Human Rights Tribunal. So there's a separation of the kind of responsibilities as in the past. Do you think that's a step forward at all? No, because neither of those are legitimate. We don't need a national nanny, a, uh, a troublemaker-in-chief, a, um, a fight picker. And that's what Barbara Hall is. She's looking for, for trouble, and she'll find it. And we don't need a tribunal where we, we dress up petty personal grievances as real legal matters. Look, I'm not saying that people's feelings aren't hurt out there. My feelings are hurt every day, Steve. I, but, I've got a but, feeling that's not the case. You look well, like you've you got a pretty thick skin. I, I, well, I, that's right. I have a thick skin because I'm in the, I'm in the public debate and I, I'm told hurtful things every day. But I don't run to the government and say, silence my opponent. I, most of the time, I ignore it. Okay, and but if can I, I don't, let, I debate. Let, 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 humor me again on this one. You don't run to the government because you're as well event. You are a well-known figure in this country. You have interests behind you who support you. I'm not saying moneyed. I'm saying, you know, regardless, intellectual, public, and so on. You're a guy who's published a magazine. You're a former columnist. I mean, you've written books. You are Ezra Levant. Now, not everybody who is attacked in public has all of that going for him or her, and therefore do they need a bit of assistance, like a tribunal, helping them in their corner in these kinds of situations? Uh, I'm just being if, devil's advocate. I'm putting it out there well, for you sure, to play no, with. Well, you're very kind and you're very flattering, but I would say this. First of all, today more than any time in history, 
any individual has the power to shout out their ideas. Get a blog. It's practically free. And if you're thoughtful and if you have ideas, you don't have to have a track record or experience or friends or money. You can shout it out. And so the media and arguing is more democratic and more grassroots than ever. And second of all, I would say, uh, just because uh, someone is high or low in a station in life doesn't mean that they should be treated without due process. I escaped the clutches of the Human Rights Commission, Steve, precisely because I am noisy and persistent and have some political friends. But that's a form of corruption, too. Uh, let's talk about the Canadian Human Rights Commission. In 32 years, not a single person who went on trial for this hate speech charge has ever won. It has a 100% conviction rate. The reason I was let go provincially in Alberta is because I was such a big pain in the neck that they decided to let me go because I was too much of a political embarrassment. But that's corrupt. If I really was guilty of spreading hate speech, which I was because the law is so vague, of course I was guilty, they should have convicted me. They let me go precisely because I can get on TV Ontario. Is it 1984, Ezra? Not quite. but. 1984 doesn't happen like that. It happens incrementally. It happens when people say, oh, freedom of speech, but. Freedom of speech, except. Freedom of speech, let's limit it for other, for other values. Look, freedom of speech is the strangest thing, Steve. It's a gift you've got to give your enemies if you want to keep it to yourself. Isn't that funny? I can't think of anything else that fits into that same mold. It's something we have to give to the folks we totally despise, people who are wrong and rude and offensive, because if they can't have it, well then we won't have our right to be dissidents. Look, I believe that publishing those Danish cartoons of Muhammad was the right thing to do as a publisher. And I want to stand by that. But let's say I was dead wrong. Let's say it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life, rude, offensive. I should still have the right to do it in Canada. We're not Iran, we're not Communist China, and we have the right to be wrong. As always, Ezra, food for thought and very provocative. It's good of you to join us. On the line from Calgary, Shakedown is your latest, how our government is undermining democracy in the name of human rights. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steve.